23 day novel contest. The writer's journey began. I'm going really slow. The Timothy and Catherine show took center stage. I'm not a complete moron. While the challenges in writing started to take their toll, especially on Ron and Laura. Are you going to shoot this the whole time? I guess it makes me want to try harder. Pomeranian to the end of the block and back again, going up the front stairs to the main door and the dim music room beyond. Timothy's on the 13th machine, busy thinking about the work. <laughs> We're getting to the end of the first day of the uh, three-day novel contest. Uh, a big challenge awaits the participants. They're going to have to become performers very shortly. They're going to do their impersonation of Jack Kerouac and Steve Allen. They're actually going to be reading their works in front of a jazz band, the Raving Poets. The Raven Poets get next robot. Beautiful indeed. Performance, that's our next challenge. Absolutely, absolutely critical to selling a book as well. In, in what aspect? Well, let's say you're going to promote your book in your hometown or be seen across North America. You're up against a million other things that could entertain people. So if you walk into a bookstore and you can't sell the books by moving the crowd, then you might as well just get on the bus and head uptown to the jail. Well, our 12 finalists, they prepared themselves with excerpts from their ongoing three-day novel marathon. So they're going to uh, perform these excerpts for us right now. Now, what they don't know are the prizes and the penalties. All right, folks, are you ready? You're not going to believe this. First of all, let's start off with the penalties. The penalty will be... I can't even say it, it's so bad. You, you say it. Stacking the shelves in the kids' book department. <laughs> the winner. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Perhaps your biggest audience ever. Oh, have you even heard of a prize like this before? It's never been done anywhere in the universe, to my knowledge. <laughs> it's so incredible. Right after midnight, the 14th machine is going to come in. You will be typing your story live to the nation. The world. Unedited, uncensored. It's never been done before. We're going to pull this off. Okay. So, first of all, we're going to be entertained by the raving poets. So I'm going to hand it over to another MC, Mr. Mike Ravel. Where are you, Mike? Take it away, Mike. So the raving poets are, are not your your tea and strumpets kind of literary reading. You know, we like to kick it out. We like to stir it up. So we mix spoken word, uh, literature, and poetry with live improv music. It's kind of in the spirit of the beat writers. So what you're going to do is come up and turn to the band and tell them what your piece is about or the, the feel of it. So a one-sentence kind of prelude. Now, I'm thinking... E minor, something a little sinister, something like a uh, one, two, three, four, uh, swing fast. Uh, gotta have some energy in here. It's about a gang of ornery talk show hosts. <laughs> a minor? E minor. This is bitter religious sexual impiety. A late October morning, see your breath cold. Frost on the ground and the dirt track stiff underfoot. A morning for quiet contemplation of the coming winter, for watching the pinking east through a cloud of coffee steam. Sonambulate through the weekly shopping, feeling like there's one too many martinis in the mor ma morning tea, a heartbeat too many in the chest. The nuance of trauma lost along the savannah of hope, driven forward by life's necessity, the language of the working class. Guys wouldn't ask girls out at our campus, and in many cases, in true Christian fashion, even steered clear of girls if at all possible. Patty was the only one I confided in about Joshua, thinking I probably wouldn't get any sympathy from the, re from the rest of my more godly peers, and too, I would look like a hoe. Boys, <laughs> I need 
murder music. This is a story about cocaine. Seriously. <laughs> The boys are out the door. Mr. Raddick, Mr. Thompson, please exit the school. We're in code yellow, code yellow. The announcement comes over the loudspeaker. Code yellow? For coward? Danger approaching? Damn. I sneak up on the Regis nearest to me and do my best to blindside him with quick right hand. It doesn't work. One of them must have seen me come from behind because the Regis moves so my hand grazes off the side of his or her head. But they always drink out of the toilet. Yeah, that's what we don't like, honey. Why don't we like it? Because it's dirty! And you shouldn't do it! Edmonton, summer some drunk First Nations people in the lot next door. It was not the best of times, nor was it the worst of times. It was the spring of the ash worms and the summer of the flyboys and the long days of Edmonton declining into an early fall. It was the summer when... My eyes felt saggy as I biked to work the next day. The veterinary clinic was at the end of our main street. It's called Huntington Street named after our town, Huntington, Alberta. Very original, I know. It was scorching hot out, and men were walking around bare-chested, even the ones who really shouldn't have been. Her mother was an obsessive, compulsive, anal retentive cleaner, and her father had a thing for squeaks. Couldn't stand them, even when they weren't there, and always had a can of WD-40 around. The only way out was to get a divorce. Traditionally, the divorce ceremony was sealed with a kiss in front of everyone at afternoon recess. When the time came, Lance ran towards me, wearing a Kleenex veil and a fistful of stinkweed. There hadn't been any of that evacuating of the bowels that Matthew was really squeamish about, especially as he needed to plant his calling card, a vial of unthawed donor semen. He had filched from Carlene's package. She stares, doesn't move. God, this is what it's like when your world falls apart. You sit in your expensive lingerie in the mud, wondering how you got here. He pulled back on the plunger to ensure that he was in his vein, and this splash of red jumped back up into the cylinder, and then he pushed the plunger all the way in. We watched him, wondering what he was feeling, and he just closed his eyes and leaned his head back. His jaw started wobbling around as though he couldn't quite find the right position for it. Rock goodbye, baby, on the treat, mommy. Hmm? I still wish the cats could talk. <laughs> Up next. I've been asked to render a judgment and I gotta render a judgment. <laughs>